Welcome to the Joyful Nourishment Podcast. This is a podcast about a relationship with food and eating, body image, eating disorder recovery, mental health, and more. I am your host, Lynn Thorstensen, a registered nutrition therapist and body image coach based in the West of Ireland. And I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to another episode of the Joyful Nourishment Podcast. And today I'm here with Brianna McAteer, who is a life coach, a TEDx speaker and best-selling author. And she has helped hundreds of women around the world to finally heal their relationship with food. She weaves her passion endlessly and endless curiosity and contrariness to get to the heart of what is true versus what is conditioned, helping women to break free from the oppressive patriarchal diet culture narrative that that's kept decades of women stuck in the restrict big shame cycle. And you will find her on Instagram. And I'm going to link to your um, Instagram page in the show notes. So anybody can go and find you there. But reading that bio as our introduction, Brianna, I think our conversation, your background and the work you do is going to be really good fit for our listeners here on the Joyful Nourishment podcast. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Lynn. I'm excited. I'm excited. I love talking all this. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I just, I'm always curious, like what brings people to this work? Because often there is a personal story. Um, and we have, we've already had a bit of a conversation around <laughs> life and living in Ireland and living in the North and different challenges with that which was not really part of this conversation but I also I suppose should be upfront and say that I did watch your TEDx talk so I got a little bit of a flavor but um where you might have come from but I would love to hear in your words if that's okay kind of your background and what sort of brought you to wanting to help women in particular break free from the binge dieting cycle yeah. Uh, yep. Personal experience. <laughs> um, I suppose initially like or kind of where I'll start is that my relationship with food was chaotic. Like it was a chaotic relationship with food. Um, I, it, you know, it, it kind of starts as early as 12, right? It wasn't chaotic at 12 but it starts as early as 12 when we start getting really conscious of weight, body image. And, and like, I was starting to be conscious of not wanting to be seen to be eating, you know, cellulite, your body's changing and all of that. And so it does start that early. It really came to like a head for me. And funny, it kind of leads on from our conversation. When I came back from Ireland, <laughs> went back to Canada uh, in my mid uh, early twenties, um, my experience in my life left me so that I had a very shallow sense of self, a very unstable sense of self, which had me searching or orientating myself outwardly. Um, and when we do that outwardly, we're stuck in comparison. We're often um, into perfectionism and people pleasing. Fawning was a, a big fawning is the the trauma response that is people pleasing was a, a consistent in mine of mine for my life, and it all kind of came to a head. And you know, I'm just thinking, I'm just like literally coming through this right now. It was probably the first time I was left on my own, right? I was like, I was responsible for myself and I did not have the skills to be responsible for myself. And mm. so I oriented myself outwardly and I got in relationships that were dramatic, whether that were friends or personal or, or intimate relationships that were always chaotic and dramatic. Um, and my way of being was to be a people pleaser, to, um, make myself be the kind of person that I needed to be to fit in into whatever group that I was in. Um, and also a lot of people pleasing control, fear, anxiety, lots of that. And that informed my relationship with food because 
it does. <laughs> because yeah. Food is our, one of our mechanisms for, um, it's really about our mechanism for nourishing ourselves, for meeting our needs when we don't have the skills to do that. And it goes on both sides, right? Over restricting and over eating. And I bounced between the two because I had no stability. I had like, I had no, I had no anchor in myself. I had no sense of self. I had, I had nothing to come home to. And so I would try and fit in by over restricting and try and gain control by restrict, like, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into this later, but getting kind of trying to gain control of my life by controlling tightly what I was eating. Um, but you know, it doesn't work that way. So then we swing to the other way and we overeat and I was out of control around food and I couldn't, I just, I would be looking at other women in my work environment going, how come they're not standing at the table shoveling food in their eyes? How come, what, like, why am I standing at the table? Even though I'm so full. And then they bring mm. out more food and I'm like, I am so full. I'm still going to eat it. I just couldn't understand why I would do that. And of course, then to try and make up for that, swing back the other way and control and tighten and restrict. And yeah. And so I pendulated through that dramatically. And the, the emotional pendulating between the two is so exhausting and so painful. And just you're living in a reality where you're constantly questioning we swear on here? Are you kids swearing? Yeah, they can swear. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with me? Like, what is wrong yeah. with me? Yeah. And I got so thin to the point where people were like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. I'm great. I'm thin. I'm so excited. Bye. Um, my, but my life was chaotic and dramatic. And I had completely and utterly abandoned myself. Um, And so I did that pendulating between the two for a while to the point where there was a, a, a romantic relationship that broke up for me, but that was just the catalyst where I lost some more weight. Um, just tried to control a little tighter. Um, but then I looked in the mirror and I was as thin as I could be without becoming unhealthy. Maybe I was a bit unhealthy weight. I was certainly unhealthy. But I was looking in the mirror going, I don't feel better. Like, this does not make me feel. And like, I thought this was going to be the answer. But I feel awful. Like, I hate myself. I feel like there's something wrong with me. I feel like I'm broken. I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel like everything is collapsing around me. I have no idea how to make a decision for myself. I have no idea how to live in this life. I have no idea turns out <laughs> turns out being thin <laughs> doesn't solve for any of those things yeah amazing but isn't all, it because we're sold that constantly constantly if i could yeah. just lose some weight then i'll be happier i'll have better relationships i'll have a boyfriend people will love me i'll just light up a room it'll be great oh it's gonna be amazing when i just lose a little bit of weight doesn't work like that no. and it doesn't work like that and I and like I never like I did my weight did fluctuate kind of I'm very small so like 10 pounds on me is a huge amount of weight <laughs> but like I never had a lot of weight to lose I never was like I was never like overweight I never had the weight stigma to to deal with um but I, even when I was in a smaller body I still thought I was too fat disgusting needed to lose weight losing weight was going to be the answer like this is this is obviously my problem because I have some cellulite because my thighs are touching, and I try to let women know that losing weight is not the answer. It doesn't no. matter how thin you are. No, because it's never enough. I think that's the thing. It's, never it's just it's never it's never enough. And even if we do lose weight and we can kind of stay there, maybe momentarily, whatever, it's like. But it's still a very precarious place, isn't it? So that's not the solid ground that you might be looking for when you're looking it. for solid ground. Oh, I love that statement, but Lynn. Yeah, that is not the solid ground, right? And it's never enough because it wasn't the thing in the first place. Yeah. So we we can't 
diet our way to self-confidence, self-trust, self-love. Like it just, it doesn't work. And the reason why I was so whoo, all over the place was because of the lack of the solid ground, was because of the relationship I had with myself, which was chaotic and dramatic and very unstable. Where yeah. I was, like I said, orienting myself outside of myself, looking for other people, other things, other solutions to make me feel better, which is, you know, what diet culture is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why it's so radical to even kind of push back against, it's not going to give you that because that isn't what, um, what, what, what we're looking for. Like the, the, the small body isn't going to give us all the self-confidence because, that's not where it is that's, even though that's how we've been programmed or sold uh or to and told that it would be there if you can get there absolutely like that has been the story we have been spoon-fed for like i said decades right and it but it's not the thing and you know what i think most on some level most women know that because most women have done it They've lost some amount of weight. They've gone to Weight Watchers or Slimming World or something. They've done something, done a fast or a cleanse or whatever. And they've lost some amount of weight. And when they lost that amount of weight, they realized this wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. I still berate myself. I still criticize myself. It's still, my thighs are still not this. It's still not enough. And either they go on to try and lose some more or it goes back on, right? Because for for sustainability and you know that's what I want to work with my clients for sustainability the way that we lose weight matters yes yeah. that's, that's the goal of yours is to lose weight the way that we lose weight is is the thing the way that you lose the weight is the thing if weight loss is a, a thing that you're interested in weight loss itself not the thing the yeah. way that you lose it is the thing if that yeah makes sense. If if you know that is something that somebody pursues and if like again i think it's important also which is something i didn't learn that people can eat well live well and still be in a body that isn't within the socially accepted norms and oh. be perfectly fine right so it's it's kind of it's yeah it's 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 that's why i don't you know encourage intentional weight loss in any way but bodies change regardless and we don't have, you know, some people lose weight when they stop binge eating because that's what their body just needs to do. And other people might gain weight because that's what they need to do. And some bodies just stay the same. And it's all fine, right? It's that kind of challenge as well. Like even if you are healing, if you heal your relationship with food and you do lose weight, that's not bad, but it's also not, it's just is, right? It's like, Okay, so that happened because it's moving away from like our bodies changing one way or the other being something that's really relevant for our own self-worth or our worth as a human being in the world. So I just think that's kind of important to, to think about too. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that happens with my clients a lot is often they are coming to me with the idea that they would like to lose weight. And what happens is that the work that we do, sometimes they like, sometimes they don't lose weight, but the, the relationship that they have with their self and the relationship that they have with their body is something that feels so much more settled and easy and content and enjoyable that they're like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> like I'm yeah. not doing it anymore. And that was the, the point that I got to. I'm like, I am not willing to because the way that I was treating my body was abusive really <laughs> I'm not willing to treat myself this way to treat the one body that I have this way to meet some imaginary ever elusive standard outside of myself that nobody gives a shit about like yeah. nobody gives a shit about yeah yeah so 
did you have a different career before you moved into coaching people around their relationship with food or was this kind of like just a natural progression of your own healing or what what's the professional journey look like <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm opening a can of worms here <laughs> No, no. I mean, I did not really. I coming from a person who was unstable and uh, didn't have a, a a sense of core sense of self. I was bouncing around. Really, I was bouncing around a lot. I lived in Canada. I worked in the film industry. I did some marketing. I worked for mental health. Like I just worked around a lot of things. But the consistent that has been in my life since I was about five <laughs> has been personal development, right? My, my mom had me listening to Deepak Chopra when I was five years old on, <laughs> on uh, tapes when I was an Irish dancer, preparing me to visualize my Irish dancing. <laughs> uh, and so for my entire life, I have been um, steeped in it, in personal development and reading and learning and um applying to myself and so I it just became it it just started to make sense that I would I was doing personal training before this and I did kind of start doing the initial meal plans and yada yada but I was like meal plans are pointless if you're not going to stick like they're pointless what we want to do is understand why don't we stick to a way that eats eating that feels good to us. Like that's what I want to, that's what I'm interested in because that's what made the difference for me. Um, and so I, I, I bounced around and then it just started to make sense that this is what I'm going to do because I, um, it was my experience and I have so much life experience to apply to this. Um, and so I became a certified in nutrition and lifestyle coaching and I'm now Oh, I'm, I'm just doing this certificate that I'm so excited about this trauma informed um, somatic feminine embodiment coaching certificate. So I'm really. Um, that sounds very exciting. Yeah. I'm loving that. every second of it. Yeah. I might have to ask you more about that. Um, <laughs> but tell me. Um, so like, I think what you're talking about here as well, it's like, and sometimes it's hard and people are doing when we're doing dieting it's very sort of surface level like you're, you know we're focusing on i have to eat x y and z and then i have to do this and then of course we can't stick to it but then there's no because there's like this end goal outcome of i want to lose x amount of pounds or my body is supposed to look y way or whatever there is so when we can't stick to the plan it's like okay i'm a failure something wrong with me I know willpower I'm no good at this um whereas when we can kind of like when when we let that go there's more space for being curious right it's like okay well why why am I drawn to eating this or why am I doing that or why is this why am I just feel helpful but then when it's not really or do you know there's no space mm. for the in, in dieting there's no space for the sense of curiosity it's very much white knuckling willpower driven mm -hmm. strict rules and focus and if you don't like and life isn't like that right <laughs> life, life requires more of a space for flexibility so why do you think it's like really helpful to explore that why and what are the types of whys you see with your own clients Mm, yeah. So the way that if it's not clear yet, the way that I come to this work or the way that I position or what's the word encapsulate my work is that our relationship with food has literally nothing to do with food. It has nothing to do with how much you like food. It has nothing to do with how much you like crisps or bread or whatever. Our relationship with food is um, representative of our ability to know how to meet our needs for nourishment. And awesome. we don't have those skills. <laughs> we don't have those skills on many levels, right? And when we initially were talking about this conversation, I said that our relationship with food really is um, about our connection to, to mother to mother on again on multiple levels our our mothers our actual mother 
her relationship with food, her relationship with her body, her relationship with that, we will suck that up, obviously. But our relationship with food is not about food, right? So what we are actually learning from her is her relationship with herself and how she meets her needs and how she tends to her needs, her emotional needs, how she gets her needs met, how she asks for support, boundaries, all those things, how she treats herself. And that's what we're learning from her. But she's not learning that in a vacuum. She's learning that from a patriarchal society for whom we have lost touch with the archetypal mother, either mother nature, who is abundant in resources and everything that we need, but also the the archetypal um, image or characteristics of mothering, which is nurturing, nurturing and caring and emotional and intuitive and receptive and natural and all of those things, right? And it's so clear how much we have lost touch with that by the way we treat pregnant women, pregnancy, Mm -hmm. birthing, (laughs) by the way we treat new mothers, how well we take care of them, how well, right? How well we treat the earth, how well, all of that stuff, right? Um, And all of those kind of characteristics of mothering emotional, intuitive, natural, whatever. I'm like, and how, like, how we're teaching parents to parent, just leave them to cry, just let themselves soothe, just punish them, teach them a lesson, put them on the naughty step. All of these things that disconnect us from our intuitive way of nurturing a child is how we have been taught to parent up until these recent years, Right. And so we have been disconnected from our ability to know how to nurture ourselves. I was about to say, oh, yes, because the information we are getting is from the male perspective. And the male Mm. perspective is reason and logic and all the things, emotional, intuitive, flowing of milk and blood, not, not their perspective. But that is where, in a patriarchal society, we get information from. That is what it means to be a, a patriarchal society. So whenever I say patriarchal, I don't mean a bunch of men getting together to, to screw over women. I mean like a consciousness shift where we have downgraded, dysregulated kind of, um, uh, what is the word I'm thinking of? I am well, sleep Care. I was just reading a book recently on, written by a guy, but like, on the whole aspect of care and how we actually quite live in a careless society which has that underpinning of like you're talking about the patriarchal structure which of course capitalism also sits under like it's about you know humans as commodities and human resources as commodities that can be used and discarded and sold and there's the whole productivity aspect in that and and how that's you know and like you're talking about mothers and now the mothers in today like you're not even being able to have the space to just be in a mother at home to care for your parent or for your children or for your aging parents or for the community because we also have to be out there earning money so mm-hmm. it's like very or less I yeah suppose. what i can say is like that kind of then translates into how we take care of ourselves or not absolutely right and so but but the important thing that i wanted to get in there was that the emotional intelligence emotional skills are not important in that paradigm yes yeah no it's not that's not something you can buy and sell no so emotional skill is not that has been repressed that has been deemed as less than caring is less than caring skills right how much do we pay carers not enough (laughs) right because it's deemed as less important all of these qualities that add to the, the the vibrancy of our emotional and mental life have been deemed as less valuable pushed to the side whereas logic and reason and whatever capitalism come to us to the forefront so then we we just haven't learned our mothers didn't learn the skills they don't they teach us how to nurture ourselves so we didn't learn the skills of emotional attunement nervous system regulation emotional care how to speak to ourselves how to treat ourselves how to fail how to like we don't learn these skills and when we don't learn these skills 
food becomes one of the only tools that we have to meet those emotional nurturing needs. We eat, overeat to suffocate them and distract ourselves and kind of pretend it's not happening, or we undereat to try and meet our conditions of worthiness in a patriarchal society. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. There's a lot. There's a lot in there, I think. Uh, and that's why it's so important. Um, I believe when we're doing this work with people to also looking at those societal influences because and I've had these conversations with other people it's like when I was in my own throes and I know this is same for you but it's like you feel like it's a you problem it's like there's something wrong with me and everybody else obviously has their shit together (laughs) but there's something wrong with with me and not really understanding some of these other outside influences that you're talking about and I feel like when we know that we can kind of reclaim the part of ourselves and our own agency and go okay there is it's not like I'm broken and there's something wrong with me actually I have the agency to take care of myself I I have like there is ways and these are and, and you can somebody put it as an it's like you can put that blame back like the stuff the blame we've internalized back on out on society where it belongs absolutely right it totally feels like it totally feels like it's a me thing but then I'm like it can't just be all of us being a me thing (laughs) like like most women have a challenging relationship with food and absolutely and the the important thing is that we our mothers and us have internalized all of these narratives we have internalized them all, which now we are, we are, they are living through us. Yeah. So it's important to, to know that this is not a me problem. This is a societal conditioning thing. But also to know that we have internalized that conditioning. Yeah. And, and that conditioning is now dictating our behaviors. Like how, how often do we rest? How often do we ask for our needs? How often? Because we have started to believe the the narrative that we've been giving that rest is weak, that you should be able to do better, that you should just power on, that your period doesn't, shouldn't stop you. Take a pill and power on, right? All of these narratives, but yes, let's acknowledge that that's what's happening. There is nothing wrong with what's going on with my body. There's nothing, nothing has gone wrong here. We have internalized these conditions we have agency to be like, okay, I am ready to give those back. And it is a, a process of unconditioning, deconditioning ourselves going, oh, I see that I still believe that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop believing that one. I'm going to take rest, right? But when we see that it's a societal thing and it's not a me thing, absolutely. It gives, it takes a weight off. It takes yeah, a weight. Reduce off. the shame, I think, a bit, or it has the potential to do that anyway. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. And there's something else I was just going to say, but it'll come to me. Anyways. So, yeah. (laughs) So, what is it, like, if you were going to give the listeners three kind of pieces of, I don't know, advice, of course, it's not personal advice because that's, we can't give that, but some general stuff that you see to the threads in your work and with your clients, like what are three things that tends to be helpful in general that might be helpful to people listening to this conversation? Mm. Yeah, and I suppose I've, I've kind of touched on uh, some of them that to really start looking at or opening up your idea to the fact that your relationship with food is not about food, right? Your relationship with food is not going to be quote unquote fixed by focusing more on what, when, and how much to eat, right? Eating or not eating, that is not going to to help you feel the peace and ease and freedom that you want to feel around food. Your relationship with food is about how you relate to yourself and your needs and how well you can nourish yourselves. And we're talking about growing up in Northern Ireland. 
in Northern Ireland here, for various reasons, I'll talk about my personal experience. We've got a lot, my personal experience is martyrdom and victimhood, right? And so when we're a martyr or a victim, we are not meeting our needs. We are blaming, right? Or blaming ourselves. And there is a lot, our relationship with food is very closely linked to the amount of criticism and shame and blame that we we have with ourselves. Mm, yeah. Our, our blame and shame and shame uh, fuels the overeating and the over-restricting because we are trying to get away from that either by numbing or by trying to, again, meet the conditions of our worthiness in a patriarchal society, which means you're thin and quiet and not too much and, you know, people pleasing and perfectionist and yeah. giving and caring. Right. So we try to do that by over restricting and meeting the, those needs or overeating by numbing, which is numbing and kind of distracting ourselves from this. So that's one. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. There's a lot in there. <laughs> okay, take the other... months or years even to unpack all of that. But it's just to realizing, okay, how might these dynamics be happening for me? Absolutely. Just kind of notice the way you're speaking to yourselves. How do you treat yourselves in any moment? When things go wrong, how do you treat yourselves? When you aren't the parent that you want to be, how do you treat yourselves? What are you telling yourself about how well you're doing your work, right? All of that is what's informing your eating, not what's on your plate or what's going to be on your plate. The other thing and the only thing, like if people take this only thing away from my work is that there is nothing, nothing has gone wrong. Nothing has gone wrong wrong your body your system is working perfectly right we have created oh a society in which food is one of our only tools or mechanisms to deal with our emotions and so that's what it's doing <laughs> right yeah. when we learn and give ourselves other tools it doesn't want food it doesn't like need food when oh, we so this, we're hungry, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't need food to deal with the emotions, right? Yeah. <laughs> when we learn how to deal with our emotions, when we learn to tune into the, the our body, what's going like because our emotions live in our body, what's going on in our emotions, the conditioning that we have that means that we treat ourselves like shit. When we kind of understand that those are the things that are going on, and when we address those, the difficulties with food just fall away. They literally just all the way I know it does so that's the two things yeah did you have a third one uh <laughs> <laughs> the third one is that for oh yes okay so the third one is that for most of us especially women we all have experienced trauma and one of the main ways that we um deal with our trauma is to go up into our head and we all become overthinkers, overanalyzers, perfectionists. We're trying to deal with things up here by thinking through everything and over like making ourselves fucking crazy, right? And for us to heal our relationship with food, it requires us to come back into attunement and listening to what's going on inside of our bodies. Because like I said, our emotions live in our body. And that's one of the reasons we've gone up there because we have no idea what to do with them. Um, and regulating the nervous system is hugely important as well. Because yeah. again, we're, we all have trauma in our body and we don't, we have not been given the skills. We have no idea. And so our, our system very smartly has decided this down here. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. I'm going to live up here. And when yeah. we live up here, then we get very disconnected from all of the, the the messages, so many messages our body is trying to give us about what we need, when we need it, how much we need. Do we need food, rest, pleasure, fun, play? Do we need any yeah. of that? But we're just not listening because we just don't have the skills. And so Yeah, and I mean, even on a basic level, if it wasn't a two-way communication, like we wouldn't know um, we need, would need to go to the bathroom, for example. And of course, there are times when, you know, we you might become so engrossed in something that those messages are, or, you know, because of trauma, like those things are just like very, very faint. 
and or consequences. We override them. Yeah, or we override them. Of course. Women yeah. are incredibly good at yeah. overriding our needs and our intuitive messages from our body. Yeah, and they do tend to get louder uh, they get, as we go along, and they get louder. They our get bodies louder. are very, very wise. And they're not out to, I think this is the other message from diet culture. It's like that our bodies are somehow mm -hmm. untrustworthy and they're out to get us. Whereas Absolutely. our bodies are our homes and Absolutely. they are not out to get us. They're there to try to keep us alive. They are absolutely like that is the one. Yeah, that's another one thing we can trust. You can trust her. She is taking care of you. She is working perfectly. Even if that, like, even if it's not serving you in this moment, it did. Whatever quote unquote maladaptive behavior that has been developed or chronic pain or illness or something that has developed, it was working perfectly in a, in a, at a time. She was, she was taking care of you. She was protecting you from something that was overwhelming. She was protecting you from something that was too much and you can trust her. And when we, when we come back into listening to her, she's going to tell you what you need. She's yeah. going to tell you. And that is work that can take a long time, I think. And, Absolutely. and depending on the backdrop, uh, it might have to be done very slowly. So Absolutely. I think it's, that's important as well to remember. So Brianna, yeah, I mean, I know we could talk probably all day. Um, so I just want to, as we bring this kind of towards a close, one of the things that I always ask my guests are, what does joyful nourishment mean to you? Hmm. Joyful nourishment to me, again, I suppose because I'm doing this somatic course right now, and I'm just really like, I'm just really experiencing it right now. I'm I have two little girls, one's four and a half, one's one and a half. And I have kind of always had to deal with a lot of anxiety. I didn't also have the skills to do with it. I'm in my head, like everything that you, I've just explained to you was my experience, right? So I have had a lot of time being disconnected from my, my body feeling chaotic, feeling out of control, feeling up in my head, feeling very heady. And when we have the skills to return to your body, which, you know, we will need to titrate, move slowly at her pace. But when you can settle there, when you can settle in her and just be like this year, has been the probably the most settled I've felt in my life, having changed nothing from last year, <laughs> except for how settled I feel in my nervous system, how settled I feel in this body so that I can be actually present. <laughs> and just, it's, and it's just the subtlest things that I would have never considered doing or that I over didn't create space for. I didn't create time for because I'm rushing and trying to trying to make things happen. And when I have let space be in my body, in my thinking, in my head, in, in the outer reality. It just feels I just it's just feels so delicious. And the attunement that I get with my girls and the feeling of connectedness that we get is just lovely that's what joyful nourishment means to me oh that's a beautiful one yeah it's, I love hearing people's different um perspective of that one question and mm. get all sorts of wide variety of answers sure. with a, a contented nervous system uh or one that's kind of well adjusted and well adapted lots of deliciousness in that mm. so thank you for sharing and thank you for coming on the joyful nourishment podcast it's been thank you. lovely um and for anybody who wants to connect with brianna they can find her on instagram on brianna mcateer Mac coaching and i will link to that in the show notes thank you so thank much you. lynn it was yeah. a pleasure too short but a pleasure <laughs> you go on all day <laughs> yes. thank you again thanks for listening 
The Joyful Nourishment podcast is produced with no financial backing and your support means a lot to keep this project going. If this episode has been helpful in any way, please consider liking, subscribing or leaving a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. This helps the podcast to be found by others. And of course, you can also forward this episode to a friend whom you think may benefit. Find out more about what I offer on straightforwardnutrition.com. And if you're interested in working with me, please use the link in the show notes to book in for a free initial 30 minute session. And finally, please come and join the Joyful Nourishment community over on Substack unless you're there already by subscribing to my newsletter using the link below.